Hello and welcome to the Conversations Podcast. I'm your host, Dallin, by the way, and tonight we have our guest, Dennis Cato. How are you? Doing just fine. Doing just fine. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, we're happy you're here. So, tell us about yourself. Uh, I am uh, the stake president for Independence Missouri Stake. I've uh, been there for four years. Uh, was, uh, was past uh, a member of the Community of Christ Church uh, and joined this church on uh, March the 4th, uh, 1988. And was that your career as well, being in that church, or did... No, uh, they, they, uh, my, my career actually was in manufacturing for uh, 40 years. Uh, made all types of different kind of products that, uh, that you would see. If I gave you the names, you'd know them on the, on the shelves. Are you allowed to say, or is that a... Oh, sure. Well, one of them particularly is Arm & Hammer Liquid Laundry Detergent. Ah. 22 million cases the last year that I, was, that I worked. And are you currently working as a manufacturer? I, reti- I retired two years ago. Okay, all right. So. And so, you already mentioned, but uh, religious backgrounds. <laughs> yeah, I was in the. Uh, I was actually fourth generation in the Community of Christ Church. Uh, my uh, my grandfather was on the Standing High Council of the church. My dad was a pastor in that church. So uh, we were. I was the fourth generation uh, as far as uh, as far as members of that church, uh, and uh, and so that was uh, that was part of the difficulty uh, as uh, as I chose to uh, to to look another direction. And we've had uh, someone who is was part of that religion before, John Davies, in in past episode. But uh, for those who did not catch that episode, would you explain some of just the basic beliefs of that? Yeah, it, it is. It, it's changed considerably over the years. Uh, when uh, when we first um, uh, were uh, were a part of the uh, community of Christ, it was uh, it w- I would call it much more conservative in nature. Uh, but then over the years, things began to change and. Uh, they went a uh, they went somewhat of a different direction, uh, and frankly, just from the standpoint of uh, of our family and as well as John, who I know very well, uh, we just no longer felt like we could just continue to walk down that path, and so we we're looking for something that would give us the stability that we needed uh, in the in the things that we believe to be true. And so, is that what led you to start looking elsewhere for? That's correct. Yes, sir. Sure was. In fact, just real quick, John Davies played at my wedding. Really, <laughs> he sure did. <laughs> We'll, we'll we'll be sure to poke him. No, no, John, <laughs> known John for a long time. So, assumably, you knew very well about the church. Sure. Long, long before you decided sure to start investigating, is that the first place you started to look when you started to? Well, I actually, when we left the uh, when we left the community of Christ, we actually were a part of a what they call a restoration group. There's several of these little groups that are meeting uh, outside the community of Christ Church. Uh, we had a group called Zion's Branch. Uh, and had somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 275 to 300 people meeting with us. And so I was there with them for about five years uh, in, the, in the process of investigating. And within that time of you being part of that branch, when did you start really looking into the Latter-day Saints? It was actually near the end. Uh, part of the reason was when we, um, my, my mom and my dad, uh, they went to, actually went to Utah and surprised mm. me because they rented a 15-passenger van and they took 11 members of my family and they went to Utah to basically investigate. And about a week later, they came back and uh, and told me that it was true, and they were all going to be baptized, and they wanted me to be baptized with them. And of course, I at that point in time, I was in somewhat of a leadership role with the little branch, and I said, no, I I wouldn't be baptized. Uh, and so upon the, upon them making that decision, I went back to the branch, and I think they kind of had a tendency uh, to look at me with a weary eye because of my family being baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Uh, and so things started to change as far as my relationship with the branch. What, what, what made the decision to finally start investigating on your own? They, uh, we got to a point where we were at a, uh, uh, we had a meeting every Saturday morning, about six or seven of the brethren, and uh, we would just do our planning, you know, whether it be for um, uh, the, those who would speak, music, et cetera. And I walked in uh, on that given morning, and, uh, and they, they basically pointed a finger at me and said, we think you're teaching Mormon doctrine. <laughs> and at that point, I wasn't teaching anything different than I'd ever taught. But I knew that they had some real misgivings now because of my family and the decision they'd made. Um, and so uh, I, I actually had in the, in the community of Christ, they actually do have sermons. And I was going to give a sermon. Uh, and, uh, and so I stood that morning and uh, I went back to First Kings and particularly, you know, Elijah, when he went to the brook Cherith and was fed by the ravens. Uh, I actually just told the, the uh, brothers and sisters at that time that I needed to leave them for a while uh, that I had some things I needed to work out in my mind. Uh, and uh, and so my wife and I left that day, and we never went back to that little group. And that began the process. 
So when you left, what were the first things you did to start finding your own? The, the fortunate thing, Elder, was I had a, a strong testimony of Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. So that limited where, I would be, where I'd be able to go because I knew I wouldn't be able to go to some of the other Protestant religions uh, based on the fact that I couldn't take those things I knew to be true with me. So it was kind of a uh, it was kind of a all or nothing situation for me. At that point, I actually called the mission president for the church, and uh, he was very familiar with the family name because eleven members of my family were baptized about a year before. It's hard to forget that. That's exactly right. And so uh, I called him and I just said, "Look, you need to send the missionaries," uh, because I said I just have to find out if it's true. And then at that point, uh, he made arrangements to send the missionaries, and the two missionaries that they sent or Elder Bird and Elder Kimball, I'll never forget them. Uh, and they knocked at the door that evening, and I opened the door, and we had a, we had a very nice evening. But there were questions that I asked them that uh, I'm probably sure coming out of Utah they had never heard before. But I told them I needed to have answers to these questions. Uh, and so I remember Elder Bird wrote feverishly, you know, the things I was asking. <laughs> uh, and then at that point in time, uh, he, uh, he said, could we come back? And I said, sure, that'd be fine. And so about three days later, we had a knock at the door, and we opened the door, and there was Elder Bird, Elder Kimball, and President Cope, the mission president. Ah. Uh, and so at that moment, he stayed with us then for the next about a month as we took uh, as we took the lessons. And what were some of the questions that you were asking? Some some of the questions, of course, going back to to again the the generations of uh, of information that we had heard. Some of them were, of course, on plural marriage, uh, the uh, the celestial marriage, baptism for the dead. Um, uh, the Adam God theory, uh, all those things that we had heard and that we'd been taught over over so many years were questions that I had, and I uh, and I just felt like that at that point in time, with the background that I had, I needed I needed answers to those things. What was the most important question you'd say was on that list? Probably the most important question that uh, eventually that really came up was the whole idea of authority. Mm. Um, I was a I was an elder in the Community of Christ Church. Uh, and uh, being an elder, I felt like that I had the authority to function uh, in, in, on that basis. And, uh, and so now uh, the struggle is I knew that, uh, that the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints felt they had the authority, and, uh, and so that was kind of somewhat of a dichotomy. I was kind of at a crossroads then with, uh, with what direction I was going to go. And for those listening who may not know that idea, would you expand on the idea of authority? Sure. The... Um, the priesthood uh, in the in the restoration, or when the, or when the church was restored in 1830, the reason Joseph was told not to be a part of any church was because there was going to be a restoration of all things, including priesthood, um, and uh, and so we have good brothers and sisters in so many other religions, but the uh, the priesthood was restored for the last time with the establishment of the church in 1830. Uh, and so what happened, though, after Joseph's assassination was there were several groups that went off in many, many different directions. And with their moving in different directions, they tried to basically say they had the authority uh, for whatever reason. And so there was a, there was a real scramble for, uh, for basically priesthood power at that point in time. And so the Community of Christ was, one of the, was probably the major offshoot of, uh, of, the, tr of the original church. Uh, and so at that point in time, we were taught that we had the authority then to function in, in priesthood, which meant ordinances such as baptism, uh, administration to the sick, you know, et cetera. And, uh, and I'd been involved in many of those things over the years. And so now, like I said, I'm at the crossroads when I have people telling me, okay, you may not have the authority you thought you had. So what led you to finally make the decision that... It, it probably, it, it, the easiest thing pr probably came down to uh, the... The splintering of the church that took place in uh, at the Nauvoo period, you know, and because what happened at that moment was there were so many people that jumped up and, and were talking specifically about um, uh, about they should be the leader because um, whether it be uh, Sidney Rigdon or whether it be Campbell or Cutler or Hed or Hedrickite, there were so many or the Hed or Hedrick, there were so many individuals that went off in so many different directions, um, and so it, what made the big difference in, as far as I was concerned was the fact that, the, uh, that when I was reading in the Doctrine and Covenants, specifically section 107 of, uh, of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Doctrine and Covenants, it specifically talked about the fact that there was a first presidency that had three specific individuals, and that also there was a quorum of 12 apostles that had the same authority as the, as the first presidency. And frankly, that was the first time I really recognized that uh, because that was actually in the script in, in the Doctrine and Covenants of the Community of Christ, but I just had never recognized that before. 
And is that what led you to decide to join the church, or did it take a little bit more persuasion? Well, probably the, the, what really took place was uh, about that fourth week of having discussions with President, uh, uh, President Cope, uh, he finally looked at me one evening and he said, do you want to know it's true? And I said, by all means, I want to know. But what was interesting is it was, it was almost like he looked through me. He, he looked at me again and he said, do you really want to know it's true? And I said, I have to. Uh, and so at that moment, uh, he said, let's kneel and pray. And so I remember that the elders and he, as well as my family, then knelt in a little circle and we prayed. And after the end of the prayer, we started to get up and he goes, how do you feel? And I said, I feel great. And he said, let's pray again. So we stayed on our knees and we prayed again. And uh, then after that, we got up and we shook each other's hand and gave each other a hug. And then the, the crossroads basically took place because at that moment he said, would you do me a favor? And I said, what's that? And he said, I would like you to allow these young men to give you a blessing. So now... If you understand, Elder, by the way, I'm I'm now I'm now really stuck because if I'm going to let them give me a blessing, what am I admitting? That I'm, they have authority. I'm admitting to their authority, and for whatever reason, I don't know whether it'd be, been because of the years of of struggle and and fighting and and the angst and the bickering, et cetera, but or, or maybe it was just the right time. But at that moment, I said, "Fine." I said, "Let them give me a let me give them a blessing," and so they put a chair in the middle of the floor, and I sit down in that chair. I've always said uh, that I, I wish I could have the uh, the big experiences like the thus saith Dennis Cato, but it generally doesn't work that way with me. But I remember that when these two uh, young men put their hands on my head, I, I remember their hands were shaking. And I thought to myself, I said, I basically fired every question you could fire at them. And these are two 19-year-old young men, and they're now going to give me a blessing. And And I don't remember to this day what was actually said. All I remember is for the first time in probably... Oh, years, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, I literally had no anger or no angst in me at all. It was like from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, it was all drained out. And all I felt was such a wonderful warmth and a peace. I mean, for the first time, it's, I liken it somewhat to when you go uh, and you, to, a, to, to a mountain and you take a deep breath of fresh air and, you, and it, almost, it almost smells sweet. There's no smog, there's no corruption. It was the same kind of a feeling. For the first time, I felt totally free of what had been a real problem, you know, for me and a real battle for me over many, many years. And so upon them saying amen, I stood up from the chair at that moment and said, I want to be baptized. And uh, that was the life-changing experience from my standpoint. And what was the space of time between that moment and your baptism? Uh, it was about two weeks. Interesting from that standpoint, too. Probably the rest of the story is is just simply this. I Because uh, uh, President Cope said, let's set a date. And I said, Let's let me find another job because at that point I worked for a man that was in this little group that I told you about earlier, and I said I know if I join this church he's gonna he's gonna let me go. And I said I've got a wife and three children, so I said let me find a job and then I'll get baptized. And so he asked me he said do you have faith? And I said sure I have faith, but I also have responsibility of a wife and three children. And he said if you have faith you'll set a date. And so literally I think it was about two weeks uh, 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 after that on a Saturday that we set the date for baptism. And so we were baptized, my wife and myself, and two of my sons were of age. And so we were, all four of us were baptized. What's interesting is the following Tuesday, I got a phone call from this man in this branch and he told me they no longer needed my service and they, uh, and they let me go. <laughs> Your predictions seem to be accurate. <laughs> exactly right, right. And so uh, you've already kind of led into this idea, but what were some of the adversity you faced after joining the church? Probably the probably the biggest adversity initially was the fact that I uh, that when I uh, when I lost the job I needed to find some employment pretty quick. The church marvelously had an opening in what they call their historic sites. Now that's where you go out and you just mow their yards and you plant their flowers for the summer or the spring. Uh, you trim, uh, and I, of course I readily took that because I thought well I need I need to, to get something some some money coming as quickly as I could while I look for another job. And then also at nights, I worked at UPS down at James Street in Kansas City as a guard. So if you can imagine, I'm sitting down at the guard shack, chugging trucks in and out at night and then working for historic sites during the day. But for six months, I had a lot of time to really you know, ask Heavenly Father the question, I did everything he wanted me to do. Why am I having to face this? You know. Um, and so uh, and about uh, six months into it, uh, I, was, I received another job or, or got another uh, a job that I uh, that I look forward to working in, and it paid about twenty five percent more than what I was making before I was before I was let go, and uh, and so it it was a real blessing. And I think I think frankly that six months was somewhat my refiner's fire. What exactly was being refined in that six months? Would you say? If 
if I went back to the restoration, the little restoration group I was in, my prayers always were somewhat like um, help more people to come. We thank you for the blessings. We are growing. We actually bought a little church building. So we thought that we were doing everything that we should have done at that point in time. And so basically my prayers are more, Lord, just keep it coming, you know. Uh, finally, though, when I, when I got to the point of basically being alone, I mean, I basically was in a situation where everything I knew to be true and all the friends that I had were gone. Uh, I then went to the Lord for the first time and said, I've made such a mess out of my life. Um, I, uh, I've taken my wife out of two different churches. She was a member of the community of Christ as well. Uh, I had baptized one of my sons in this restoration group. Now, now we're being baptized in a, you know, in, into the, uh, the church. Uh, and I just couldn't feel, I, I didn't feel like I could make another mistake. I just couldn't make another mistake. And so the prayer was, Lord, you're going to have to help me on this. You're going to have to, you're going to have to give me the guidance that I need to make the right decision. And this no longer is about what I want, but it's, but it's about what you, what you, what you want, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And so, so it changed dramatically at that point. And you, what year did you say you were baptized? March 4th, uh, 1988. 1988. And so after almost uh, 30 years now, what further refining has happened, would you say? It's, uh, th there's, been, there's been a few steps, you know, along the way, uh, of course. Um, uh, one of the first uh, callings I had when I joined the church was young men's president. And I remember, <laughs> and I remember having nine young men, and I remember walking in the first night. It, it's clear as a bell to me. I walked in the first night, and there's nine young men sitting in these chairs, and uh, they were all from different, uh, you know, time or points of life and, and financial, et cetera. Uh, and uh, and I very much wanted to see them go on a mission. And so the qu my question at that point was, how do I reach out to them? I mean, I'm new. I, I'm still learning as far as the church was concerned. Uh, so what could I do to, to to help them as far as their testimonies were concerned? Um, and what's amazing about that is it was a real learning experience for both them and I because it ended up all nine of those young men went on missions. And so I, I, was very, I was very pleased with that. Uh, we then, uh, I then was an Elders Quorum president. Uh, that's an experience. Um, <laughs> that's basically somewhat, I think, the heartbeat of the war. That's where all the young families are. Young, you know, young fellows that are, that are trying to, uh, to get jobs or employment to take care of their families, ch small children, uh, and, and how to get them to, to come together and to, and to unify and to, and to do the things they needed to do as far as reaching out for the spirituality from the standpoint of the ward. Uh, so I was, in, I was in that position for about two and a half years, and that was a real learning experience for me. I mean, it was, it was a real growth experience on, on what it takes to not only get people to maybe listen and to open up, but, but how, to, how to help them find themselves spiritually. Uh, and so it was, it was a real growth opportunity for me. Uh, I then served in, a, in two different bishoprics uh, as counselor. Uh, I then was a bishop for seven years in Independence Third Ward, um, and uh, had about a year off and then went into the state presidency and then have been state president for the last four years. You mentioned when you were elders quorum president, you really learned how to both get people to open up and to both socially and spiritually to any, not only elders quorum presidents, but any kind of president of auxiliaries. What would you recommend for that? I think the big thing that we that we tried to do, or the big thing that I tried to do, was there is what I call the law of distraction, and uh, and it's really functioning uh, today. I mean, it's much worse today than it was even back then. But we find things that we can fill our life with, and and so what it was what was really important from the standpoint of the elders back when I was elders quorum president was to simplify their lives, um, and that is that I, I have the uh, I have a real firm belief that when you talk about tithing, uh, you also tithe time and talents. And so if we would tithe 10% of our time and talents, which would be about 17 hours a week, it will really help us from the standpoint of our strength in, in regards to members, uh, our, our, you know, our relationship with our families, our children, et cetera. If you'll just give 17 hours, there's 168 hours a week you know, in, a, in, the, in that time period. Can we just give 17 hours to the Lord? And that was, we found that if we could, that as people did that, that there were so many blessings that came in their lives just by them giving a little bit more of their time. Sounds like consecration. Is what it's, it's exactly what it, it, similar. In terms of culture and uh, sociality, I suppose, what were some of the adjustments that you faced during? <laughs> we we get, I can sit and laugh a little bit about it because in the community of Christ, there was no home teaching and visiting teaching. 
for example. So all of a sudden now I've got responsibility for families that I'm calling on, you know, each and every month or maybe, a, you know, twice a month or whatever the situation is. But, but what a marvelous experience that was and what a learning experience that was for me. Because at that point in time, I now had direct responsibility as a calling for, for specific families in the ward, their well-being, their needs, uh, the, the joy we find in serving together. Uh, that was a that was a real adjustment because w- when when you're in most churches you you basically go on Sunday and then you basically have the rest of the time to yourself. All of a sudden, I found that to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, it was literally your life. I mean, you lived it every day. It was not something you could hang on the shelf for six days a week and then pick it back up for three hours on Sunday. It, it was it was a life's avocation. For those that find that demand difficult to be constantly dedicated you know, throughout the whole week, what would you recommend to, for those that find it difficult? There's probably, a, there's probably a, a, a scripture that, uh, that stands out. I think probably most bishops use it, for example, at tithing settlement time, but, but that scripture is in Malachi 3.10. And, and so what I basically told the people or what I've told my, the, the members that I'm responsible for is I've said, test the Lord. Because when the Lord tells you, for example, in that scripture, that if you do these things, okay, I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you won't be able to contain then what I'm telling members are, test him. He, Prove he, me now here. That's right. He told you that he would do this. So by all means, let, let's test him and see if, uh, if, if, if he will really follow through. And I, and I promise you, he will never let you down. He never will. But we have to basically, basically kind of make that first step to say, I'm going to have the faith enough to do this, okay, and then see what comes. And that, and that's sometimes as difficult for, for individuals to make as that first step. As you look back on your now 30 years close to 30 years of being a member is there any decisions or anything of of that sort that you find regretful or remorseful or no i i frank probably the biggest regret i've got is why i didn't do it sooner uh <laughs> i i joined the church when i was 37 years old so for example i watch all you young men and, and young women be able to go out and serve missions so my wife and i of course have the desire that that, that maybe there will come a time uh Maybe after I'm uh, finished my time as state president, that I will be able to serve a mission with my wife, because I I think that would just be a magnificent thing, and that's something that we did we just didn't get a chance to do because of the kind of the lateness of of joining the church. Looking back on it, I I, I really thought it was it was really silly on my part why I was I never treated the missionaries badly, but I always just I, but I was some, probably somewhat curt, just simply saying thank you for you know for sharing with me, but no, not now. And, uh, and, I, and I think it took, again, like we talked about earlier, it took that refiner's fire to say, I've got myself in a bind, okay? And, and I'm gonna, I really need to now listen to what Heavenly Father's got to say. So I'm going to ask you a question of a threefold question. Sure. What would you recommend to first someone who is on the fence of joining the church? Uh, two, someone who uh, was once with uh active in the church but has now found themselves not as much and three someone who is active in the church but they're they're tired they're they feel that they've just messed up over and over they're just simply exhausted of the demands what would you recommend to those three parties probably probably the first group you talk about which are those who are somewhat on the fence as far as joining the church is concerned i my my feeling is this I've had people, and I think probably the reason I went through the experiences I went through was because when people come to me and say, I may lose my friends, you don't understand. I can sit there and say, yeah, I do understand. I mean, there were 300 people in that little group that never spoke to us again. But, but what we've gained is such a marvelous family. I mean, I mean the, the responsibility I have now is 4,161 members of, of the church. And, and, and I can literally sit here and tell you I love each and every one of them. Uh, and so that that has expanded my family dramatically. So so my my first counsel then would be one faith. I mean, what's the tenets of the gospel? We talk about you have to have faith first, then repentance, then you're baptized with water, and then you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then we'll talk a little bit about the fifth one, which is endurance, in a minute with the next group. But but what it takes is it takes faith, and it takes setting aside personal concerns. It takes setting aside it, what uh, what other individuals may say. Because when you're, when you're going to join the church or make this decision, it is very personal, and it's basically between you and Heavenly Father. And until you get to that point, it's very difficult to make that decision. So I would tell them it is a personal situation that needs to be between you and Heavenly Father. And once you have that determination, you can't look back. I've had people, for example, that maybe have decided, 
well, I want to put my baptism off. I want to, I want to pray a little bit more. And I've told them, once the Spirit has told you, we really don't have a right to go back and ask again. We already have our witness. So, so you need to move Look forward. Look that put Barn Harris. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. Correct. Exactly right. Now, th then we also have, uh, we have a few that, uh, that have been a part of the church. Some of them have been very cherished that, that are struggling now. Um, I think this morning, for example, we, we, we heard from our new prophet that talked specifically about, about something similar to that. Uh, we need to be very careful that, that part of our experience, I guess, in life, I would just simply say is we're learning line upon line, precept upon precept. I think it talks about that in Isaiah chapter 28. And so what we need to be very careful of is that we're, uh, that we're basically letting one thing shift us off the focus. Okay, because basically in Matthew 22, what's the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord thy God. That's exactly right. Neighbor. With all thy heart, might, mm -hmm. mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor. If we, can, if we could just do that, okay, and we can hang tightly to that, I think we'll find that most of these other things will fall into place. But we have a tendency to let things get us off, you know, off focus. Or, the distraction. Off, that's back to the law of distractions again. And so, like Elder Holland made a comment one time, he basically said, Whatever you believe in, you hang on to that as tightly as you can hang on to it, and then other answers will come. And so you just need to hang on to those things you know to be true. All right? And then your third group was? Those who are active in the church, but oh, are tired. finding difficulty. Yes. Tired, yes. Um, I am, I'm always interested at that. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I think when the Lord tells you in the Scriptures that He won't give you any more than you, than you can bear, I, I like to take that into, into account. Um, I think, I think the adversary does a marvelous job of selling us on, uh, on, on being tired and run down. Uh, I think that if we, uh, if we spend our time truly serving as we should serve, I think the strength comes with, you know, through our service. I have seen some individuals that were just struggling with, with bad days or, or maybe a little bit of uh, anxiety or, or some depression. Uh, and, uh, and basically my counsel always to them is go out and serve someone. Uh, because, because when you get to a point of saying, it's not all about me, it's now about whoever I'm going to reach out to and whoever I'm going to serve. It's an amazing thing, the strength that comes and the joy you find in that, uh, in that service. So one of the things I tell members that just sometimes feel a little bit run down is just go serve somebody. In retrospect, if there was one idea or principle or moral of your story, what would you say that is? Probably the, the, uh, the moral to the story would simply be if you, if you listen for the leadings of the Spirit. Uh, I, I think I struggled a bit uh, with, with understanding what the Spirit was trying to tell me. Uh, and maybe we have a tendency to kind of kick against it, you know, instead of, instead of, instead of really paying attention. Uh, and, and so if, if there's a moral to the story is as, as the Spirit guides, okay, as we have direction and guidance in that situation, we need to quickly follow that path. All right, and we need to be able to recognize that spirit. Okay, there is there. If if you're feeling if you're feeling anxiety, chaos, um, disruption in your life, you need to recognize what spirit that is. All right, and and I have and one of the joys that I found is that as we if we really immersed ourselves as far as the gospel was concerned, a lot of that chaos and that and that and that discomfort and that misunderstanding, it's it, it all went away, and it's just been so much more of a peaceful existence the last thirty years than in the battle that I faced before that. What are some of the final thoughts you have to say before we end? I think, I think that I would just, I would just probably share my testimony more than anything else. I, I am, I, I just feel blessed that I'm, uh, I'm where I'm at at this point in time. I never once thought that I would ever be a bishop and by all means, I never be a stake president. Uh, but I would, I would tell you that one of the things that I told Heavenly Father uh, is that uh, because he got my family and myself here, that I would work as hard as I could for as long as he let me work. And I just strive very hard not to break that promise. I'll just work as hard as I need to work with the understanding that I know Jesus Christ lives. And because he lives and because what he's done for me, I mean, he literally has saved my life. I am far from perfect, but he basically has told us that if we'll do whatever we can with what we have, he'll make up the difference. And I, and I just leave that testimony that Jesus Christ, because he does live, he's very much involved in our lives and wants to see us return uh, to his father someday. Well, thank you for being on the show with us. Appreciate it. We're glad for your time. We're glad for your talents, your words, and braving the cold. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll be going back out into the cold. That's so. exactly right. But thank you for being on the show. Appreciate it very much. Thanks.
The Conversations podcast is not affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the viewpoints and experiences of the guest and the podcaster. While this show deals with different ideas of faith and religion, nothing said in this episode is intended to be critical of church leaders, policies, doctrines, or practices of the Latter-day Saint Church or any other religious organization.